Ever start something new and then reach the point where you're starting to feel discouraged? Whether it's a New Year's resolution or turning over a new leaf? I think we all get to that place of discouragement. But when we realize it, if we learn to overcome it with the right tools and the right mindset, we can push through it. So if you've ever felt discouraged, I invite you to join me today as together we unlock biblical wisdom for life on the topic of facing and overcoming discouragement. Hi, I'm Pastor Willie Vaughn with Out of the Box Ministries. I wanna thank you for joining me today. We're in our third week of Reconstructing the Soul, our Reconstructing the Soul series, as we look through the book of Nehemiah. And before we begin, I wanna give a shout out to Alice. Alice, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our ministry and a part of our family. I'm really excited that you've joined me today because I think discouragement is something we all face, but I don't know what to do with. I want you to think about this question. What if discouragement is merely part of the process? You think, I think we tend to lie to ourselves and believe that successful people are the people who never face any discouragement. But rather, I think that successful people are the ones who realize that discouragement is part of a process, part of the process of success, and have learned not only to face it, but how to overcome it. So today, we're gonna read and start in Nehemiah chapter four, I'm gonna read verse six through 23 to get the full story. And then we're gonna go back and analyze how Nehemiah and the people of Israel deal with the discouragement that they face. And it says in Nehemiah chapter four, starting with verse six. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it had reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart or they worked with enthusiasm. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them. We will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places posting them by families with their swords, with their spears, and with their bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of the men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind the wall, all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did work with one hand and held a weapon in the other, and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the men who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and it spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers had my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes each had his weapon, even when he went out for water. Last week, we talked about the power of a pause in chapter two, and we said that not much really happens in chapter two. 
It was just that time of pause. And in fact, the only thing that happens are the six words in verse 18, where it says, so they began this good work. And then we kind of skipped over chapter 3. But that's where a lot of the work begins. And the people worked hard. They worked with enthusiasm at all different parts of the, of the wall. And I encourage you to read that for yourself. There were people who kind of struggled with authority. There were those who worked enthusiastically with zeal. Those were those who just kind of did the wall right out front of their own home. And some of them left gaps in the wall. But everyone was doing something. It was your action chapter. But as we start out this time, we get to our halfway point. And that's where the discouragement sets in. In fact, verse 6 says, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half of its height. For the people worked with all their heart. You see, when you start out on something new, you have that energy and that enthusiasm and that zeal. There's something about it, the excitement of something new. But then you get into it, and about halfway through the process, discouragement shows up. And that's where our story today starts. It says, when the wall was half finished, when they got halfway through, the wall was built to half of its height. Because for the beginning part of this project, everyone worked with enthusiasm. And I think no matter what we're trying to do, when we're reconstructing our souls, when we're trying to start something new, when we get started, there's an enthusiasm, there's a passion. But then about halfway through in the process, the discouragement starts to set in. And I think this is really important for us to remind ourselves that discouragement is part of the process, that it's not anything new, that it almost seems like every time we do something, there's a time where it just starts to wind down. And we start to wonder, where did the enthusiasm go? But again, that's just part of the newness. And so we learn to take that in stride when we're facing discouragement, when we're starting to see ourselves bogged down in, in the drudgery, when, when the new project goes from being exciting to being a, being a bit of work. That's okay. Expect it, welcome it, and realize it's a part of the process. And it means that you're halfway there, that you've really gotten into it. It reminds me of that joke of the, the guys who were in the boat and started to sink. And the one guy, finally, he swam halfway back to shore and he realized he wasn't going to make it, so he swam back to the boat. And sometimes that's how we can get. You're halfway there. Don't give in to the discouragement. It's part of the process. And if you keep up and you learn to overcome that discouragement, you're going to complete your project. You're going to see your project finished. You're going to see new things happen. You're going to see a completion come about. So welcome discouragement. Say, okay, this is just my halfway point. It means I'm almost there. It means I just got to continue a little bit further. And welcome that as part of your process. But then they started to face the discouragement. And I want to read verse 10 and 11. It says, Meanwhile, the people in Judah, the strength said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is much rubble, and we cannot build the wall. Also, our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them, and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. You see, there's two types of discouragement you got to deal with. See, we all face discouragement, but there's the internal and the external. And it's that internal, it says, the people in Judah said the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's too much rubble. We're not going to finish. And we all have to deal with that inside voice, that internal voice. It's that internal struggle when we find discouragement from ourselves. And we got to give ourselves our own words of encouragement. And so how do we handle this? When we get discouraged, when we start to get weary, when we start to get bogged down in the drudgery and the work of it all. Well, you know, in our culture, at least in my culture and in our time, there's always been two phrases that seem to pop up. No matter what problem you're facing, no matter what challenge, there's either there's a pill for that or there's an app for that. But I think going beyond that, going beyond trying to take a pill to solve our discouragement problems or trying to get some new app on our phone or some new technology, no matter what challenge we face in life, there's a scripture for that. There's a verse for that. And Romans 12, 11 says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keeping your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. It's keep that zeal. you got to keep that passion and that fire and that excitement and enthusiasm alive. Now hold on, before you start arguing with me, because I know there's got to be somebody saying, Yeah, well, I know that's what I want to do, but how do you do it? Look into Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30 and 31. And it says everyone gets tired, even young men get tired and grow faint and get weary. But then verse 31 says, But those who hope in the Lord, those who put their trust in God, who wait on the Lord, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. 
And so it doesn't, the Bible just doesn't say, you know, keep your excitement, keep your zeal, but it tells us how. He says, yeah, we're going to get tired. It's not a sin to get tired. It's not bad to get weary or get discouraged at all. That's a part of life. That's why God's word has so much to encourage us about it, how to face it and overcome it. But it says, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. And so it's about having our inner focus. In Matthew 6, 22, Jesus said, if the eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is dark, how deep is that darkness? And so it's about how we see things. If we start looking at the goodness, if we wait upon the Lord, if we focus on God and focus on the blessings, You've heard it said, you know, you can look at the glass as being half empty or half full. And again, we're at our halfway point. When you face discouragement, you're at your halfway point. So if your eye is seeing that glass is half full, you realize you've already accomplished half of what you need to do. You're halfway there. Or you could say you can focus on looking at what you haven't accomplished yet. But if your eye is good and you're really going to focus and, and think about all the blessings God has given you in your life, and how much you've already overcome, and about your testimony, and where you've been, and how far you've already moved in whatever process you're going through, you're gonna have that energy. Your whole body will be full of light, Jesus said. And what is light? It's energy, it's vitality. So if you can look at things right, even in your own mindset, and that internal voice, and say, you know what, I'm not gonna focus on what I haven't yet done. I'm gonna focus and look about all that I have already accomplished. And then your whole body will be full of light. Your whole body will be full of energy and vitality. And you will have the strength to overcome that discouragement. This is not bad to feel it, but how we overcome it is by looking at the things in the right way. About looking on the bright side. Looking at the fact that we are halfway there. That we've already accomplished so much. And so when you face discouragement, don't focus on where you haven't been yet. Focus on how far you have come. And your whole body will be full of light. You will be able to keep that spiritual zeal and fervor. And so they were facing in our story that internal. But also we have to remember that there's an external. And sometimes we can be our own worst enemy, but sometimes we have another enemy out there. And in verse 11, it says this about those enemies. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. And there's voices. Now, we've gone on and on in the past couple of weeks and keep touching on this idea of enemies. And I think it's something we need to keep reminding ourselves. Not everyone's your friend. And maybe it's just how God has been speaking to me that to, to realize that not everyone's gonna be for you. There are gonna be people that are working against you. Or maybe it's the fact that we just need to keep reminding ourselves of the fundamental truths. And God's word said, in fact, in 2 Peter 1.12, Peter says, it is no, no trouble for me to keep reminding you of these things, even though you are already rooted and grounded in them. You are already foundational in them. And I'll keep doing so. It's good to remind, because we need to remind ourselves again and again of these important truths, that we do have an enemy. But I think that external enemy, sometimes we need to identify it correctly. We need to look at it in the right way, even as Jesus said, with our eyes being good. Ephesians 6.12 says, Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against strongholds in the heavenly realms and spiritual forces and powers and authorities. And see, it's not so much that we're fighting the people around us, the naysayers, but understanding that those people are coming against us, are trying to discourage us out of their own brokenness. Maybe you've heard it said that hurting people hurt people. And I think that's true, but it's also true that held back people try to hold back other people. And sometimes people aren't really against you or even so much, it's not that they're the enemy, it's that there's a, a spiritual aspect to it. That we have an enemy of our souls who's trying to hold us back. And if he can't get inside of us, he's going to come at us through other people. Through other people who've been held back. Through other people that have been hurt. Through other people that have been broken. And it's usually those people around us, empowered by that bitterness, by that darkness, that are trying to discourage us. Trying to sneak in and steal our joy, steal our zeal, steal our fervor, and bring about discouragement. 
Maybe they're trying to bring about discouragement because they themselves feel discouraged. And when we can identify it in the right way, we can overcome it in the right way. If you're just trying to identify people and not seeing where they're coming from or why they're doing it, you could internalize even their discouragement. Or you could spend all your time fighting people when they're not really your enemy. See, the Bible tells us that when we fight these spiritual forces, we are fighting forces of evil. See, that we have this enemy. God has this enemy, Satan. That's what Satan actually means. It means enemy. And he's trying to hurt God, but he knows he can't get to God. So what does he do? He goes after God's most prized possession, or God's most prized treasure. And what is that? That's you. He tries to hold you back. He tries to hurt you. John 10.10 10 says, The devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy to try to hurt God by coming at you. And remember that you are God's most prized treasure. In fact, John 3, 16 says, for God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that if you would just believe in him, put your faith and trust in him, Jesus, you would not perish, but you would have everlasting and eternal life with him. You are God's most prized treasure. He loved you so much, he was willing to let his son, Jesus, die on the cross for you. And so what better way for God's enemy to try to hurt God than to try to attack you, to try to discourage you, or to try to discourage the people around you. And sometimes, again, it's that external. It's got, it, he can't get to you if you're putting your hope and your trust in Jesus, if you're really walking with God. So what does the enemy try to do? He tries to attack the people around you to use them to discourage you. And so we need to be aware that there's the internal and the external forces of discouragement and to handle both in the appropriate ways. But I think discouragement is kind of like stress. I don't know if you've heard it, heard this illustration, but stress is kind of like water and you could be the boat. Now see, when a water doesn't get into the boat, the boat will just float on top of that and the water has no power over it. But if that water gets inside the boat and becomes internal, it'll sink that boat down quickly. It's the same with discouragement. When there's these forces of external discouragement, as long as you understand where they are and you guard yourself from them, you're able to float above that level of discouragement. Just don't let it become internal. And sometimes what we do is we give too much power to the external, to the external discouragement. Sometimes we say, well, they must be coming against us and against me because they know something I don't or because they're really smart. Again, remembering, not everyone has your best interest in heart and some people just discourage you out of their own brokenness. So we need to learn to guard, guard our hearts and guard our weakness. And again, this is something that comes up over and over in Nehemiah as it talks about reconstructing our souls, guarding our heart. I think we even talked about that last week. But in, in this chapter it says in verse 13 therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places posting them by families with their swords and so Nehemiah says we needed to guard the lowest points the exposed places and you need to know and be aware of yourself you need to know yourself and know your lowest points. You see, when does discouragement usually set in? When we're at our lowest, right? When do we end up giving up? When we feel weak or tired? When we're at our lowest point? Nehemiah made a point to fortify and guard the walls at the low points. And when we are reconstructing our souls and facing discouragement, when we get to that halfway point, we need to do the same thing. We need to guard our low points, guard ourselves in our lowest points and in the exposed places. If you've ever been a part of a recovery program or aware of them, they really caution and guard, said to guard against the HALT concept. To be aware of when you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, or when you're tired. Those are your lowest points. Those are the points when temptation really can get the upper hand. Those are the points you really need to guard against. And guard against those lowest points in those exposed areas. Or sometimes it's just knowing your weakness. See, your weakness may not be my weakness. My weakness could be Dr. Pepper and pepperoni pizza, but your weakness might be something else. Maybe it's Twinkies and Pepsi, whatever it is. But we have to be aware, what are our own personal weaknesses? And we have our weaknesses where we fall short. We have our weaknesses when we are prone to get discouraged. 
Maybe when we're more tired or when we're hungry or just certain times of the year and times of the month. I have been affected throughout my life with a seasonal depression when it gets darker during the day. So I need to make sure that I'm guarding myself and make sure I get lots of light in my life in those dark seasons and those dark times of the year. And so we need to know what our weaknesses are, our exposed areas. In Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 9, it talks about the little sister. And it says, if, if she's a wall, then we will build a tower made of silver and, and decorate her. But if she is a door, then we will panel her up with cedar panels and enclose her in. And so maybe your weakness is that doorway, that doorway for discouragement. And though you gotta be able to watch out and guard those exposed areas. Guard your weaknesses, find your low points, find the areas where you're most likely to be discouraged and guard those areas. But also remember that we have to rely on one another, that we don't have to do this alone. And it says that Nehemiah said, the work is extensive and spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. So when you hear the sound of a trumpet, join us there and our God will fight for us. And so sometimes in our lives, we get spread out. We get spread out from one another. We kind of get, especially in this past couple years, haven't we gotten a little bit of isolation and it's kind of creeped into how we are, but you need to have people that you can call on. You can blow the trumpet and say, hey, I'm at a low point. Hey, I'm feeling exposed. Hey, I'm experiencing discouragement. And they can come and rally to you and encourage you and lift you up and be there to watch your back. Because God's word says here in Nehemiah, it says, not only will you have other people around you fighting for you and protecting what you're trying to do, protecting your project, protecting your heart, but God will also fight for you. Jesus promised when two or more gather in my name, he said, I'm there. And so we need to get people around us when we're feeling discouraged in our lowest points, in our low places, in our exposed areas. We need to create accountability in our lives when we're trying to rise to a higher level and overcome discouragement. And so we need to be aware of those things, know ourselves and guard our hearts and guard our weaknesses. And then, but sometimes even having the motivation to do that, we need to remember and get back to why we started the project in the first place. Again, remember that discouragement usually comes at the halfway point. See, when we're starting that project, we're all excited about the newness of everything. But as we get into doing the work and the routines and the disciplines that we have to have in order to accomplish something great, then we have to remember and sometimes go back to remembering why we began in the first place. And verse 14 says this, After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes when you're starting something new, when you're trying to reconstruct your soul and you face that discouragement, Nehemiah says, remember why. Remember why you started this project. Remember why you're trying to bring yourself to another level. Remember your wife. Remember your husband. Remember your family, your children, your friends. Remember how God wants you to experience greatness in life. Remember that you are worth it. And the Bible talks so much about remembering. And when you remember your why, you're filled back up with that zeal and that fervor. When you remember, but sometimes the discouragement comes when we forget why we started in the first place. Remembering the why is so important to overcoming discouragement. Why are you trying to do what you're trying to do? Why are you trying to get yourself to a better place? Why are you trying to get healthier? Why are you trying to pursue higher education? Why are you working so hard at your job? Why are you trying to get that promotion? Why are you trying to overcome that addiction? Remember your why when you're reconstructing your soul. Because in remembering your why, remembering the people in your life that you want to be a blessing to, that you don't want to cop out on, that you don't want to give in to, and remember your why. Jesus, that night before he was crucified, had that communion, that last supper. And he told his disciples, he said, this is my body, the bread, and this is my blood, the wine. And he said, as often as you partake of this, you remember what I've done for you. And maybe sometimes in your life, you need to remember the why. Remember that Jesus said, you know what? 
you were worth dying for. Jesus looked at you and said, you were worth me having my body broken for you. That you were worth me being willing to pour out my blood for you, to redeem you, to give you eternal life. Remember that you're worth it. Remember what God's word says, that God loves you. And remember that if God thinks you're worth it, then you are worth it. If God thinks you should be experiencing abundance, then you need to be experiencing abundance. If God thinks that you should have an exciting, fulfilling life, then you need to have an exciting, fulfilling life. Remember the why. Remember why? Why? Because God loves you. Why? Because God created you for more. Why? Because you're created in the image of an awesome God. That's what Nehemiah said. Remember our God is great and awesome. And remember he's not only great and awesome, but he loves you. And so whatever it is you're going through, when you face discouragement, remembering God's love, remembering why you should keep going, remembering why you can overcome discouragement, because you are worth it. And then you remember the the reason why you need to find balance. In verse 16, it says, from that day on, half the men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people in Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held the weapon with another. And we need to find the balance in life. Sometimes we face so much discouragement as we can get off balance in our lives. And so Nehemiah says from that time on, from when the discouragement started to set in and the attack started to be looming, he said he had the men work with one hand and carry a weapon with the other. In our spiritual lives, I've often said this and told my sons this, you have to work like everything depends on you because it does. And pray like everything depends on God because it does. And we need to have that balance. Sometimes we can get so caught up in praying and, and, and relying on God, but we never put into action what God puts on our heart to put into work. Or we can get so caught up in doing all the work that we never invite God into the process. See, the weapons that these men were carrying are like our weapons, our spiritual weapons, the weapons of our warfare, of prayer and worship and praise. And we need to have that balance in our lives in every endeavor that we do. You see, like, have you ever seen boxing and watch boxers train? They have to remember they have two hands. Nehemiah said, with one hand the guys did their work, and with the other hand they held a spear. And even in boxing they teach you, it says, when you throw a punch out, make sure to keep your other hand up to guard. See, with one hand you're working, with one hand you're attacking, and the other you're defending. A lot of times they get into trouble when they let that one hand down to throw a punch, and they open themselves up for another attack. But having that balance, using both hands, one to work and one to defend, one to attack and one to guard. In our spiritual lives, we need to have that doing the work, doing the work physically. You can't just pray yourself into better health. You can't just think yourself into a better lifestyle. You have to work at it too. We have a body and a soul. And James chapter 2 says, faith without deeds is dead. Just like the body without the spirit is dead. You need to have both working. You need to have your faith, you need to have your spiritual aspect balanced out and active and engaged as much as you need to have your physical body engaged in the process. There are things we do with our hands, there are activities, there are disciplines that we have to have. In our spiritual life, there's the disciplines. You gotta read the Bible and make sure you're getting that word of God into you and pray. You don't just say, well, I hope it happens. God's gonna do everything and he's just gonna pour all the wisdom and all the power into me. You have to actually do the things. You gotta get down on your knees. You gotta fold your hands in prayer. You gotta use your voice and use your actual physical voice to sing out praises and to cry out prayers to God. It's the physical as well as the spiritual. And we are not just physical beings. That's what science of our modern day tries to tell us, that, oh, we're just basically animals. But we know in our hearts that we are more than just flesh and blood, that we are spirit. And so in our lives, when we face discouragement, we need to make sure we have a balance. We have a balance of both things. We have the balance of doing things and taking care of our physical bodies because they have an effect on our mental state and our emotional state and our spiritual state. And we need to make sure that we're feeding our spirits. You can't just make sure you eat well and exercise and and get plenty of rest physically and not take care of your spirit. Make sure that your spirit is rested. Make sure that your spirit is rejuvenated and exercise. Exercise your faith. Keeping that balance. 
finding that balance just like they did in Nehemiah's time. And in what you're going through, if you want to overcome discouragement, you can't just work through it in the physical. You got to invite God into the process and keep that balance working and using your spirit. But then you got to keep up your momentum. And as we close out this passage, starting in verse 21 through 23, Nehemiah says, So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time I also said to the people, Have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when we went for water. Now you can't run full throttle all the time. But sometimes when you're facing that discouragement and you realize you've gotten to that halfway point, you need to double down your efforts and put in that last bit and keep up your momentum. Throughout high school, I ran cross country here at High Point. And I remember no matter how you ran the race, it was a five kilometer race, 3.1 miles. When you got to the end, you gave it your all. When that end was in sight, you doubled down and gave everything you had. You let it all out and you worked hard for that last bit. And so Nehemiah is saying, we've already gotten to the halfway point. We've already built the wall halfway up. We're almost there and we're facing discouragement. So we need to double down. And from that point on, they work from early until late. Again, this is not something you live by constantly, but when you're overcoming discouragement, sometimes you gotta just put in a little extra effort and get yourself to that finish line. And our motto in cross country at High Point was carpe diem, which is Latin for seize the day, seize the moment, take that opportunity to say, okay, I'm getting discouraged, so I'm gonna push even harder because I'm almost there. Discouragement wouldn't be happening if I wasn't getting somewhere, if I wasn't close to my goal, close to my finish line. And so sometimes you need to double down. In Hebrews 12, one, it says, since we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, since people are watching you, let us make every effort to let go of every distraction and every sin that so easily entangles us and run with endurance the race set before us. And that's what we need to do. We need to keep that momentum when we have discouragement. Start letting go of the discouragement, letting go of the extra baggage, letting go of that negative thought life and run with endurance. We need to double down and say, you know what, I'm gonna get to that finish line. And that's how we overcome discouragement. Discouragement is always part of the process, but God has given us the tools and the weapons to overcome it. We remember to watch our hearts and guard our hearts and keep ourselves from being internally discouraged, to guard our weak spots and our lowest points, to remember the why, to find our balance and keep that momentum until we get to the place where we want to be. So the next time you find yourself experiencing discouragement, I hope you dive into God's word. Maybe you watch this again and you encourage yourself. You find someone else to come along. You sound your trumpet and lean on God. Lean on his strength because God loves you and wants you to experience goodness in life. That's all for today. I want to thank you for joining me. And as always, remember, Jesus loves you and so do I.